Awesome. Ooh. Ah, loud and clear. Let's stand together, church. Father, we honour you, we glorify you, and we magnify you, and we open up our hearts to you tonight. Father, what a privilege it is to be in your presence and to focus on you and your word and to hear from your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we love you, we give you liberty, and we honour you, and we welcome you. We welcome you, we welcome you into this place, Holy Spirit. We love your presence, and we don't take your presence for granted. And we pray all of these things in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Well, I'll give you a wave if you're excited in this place tonight. Yes, we're running in.
here. Oh, we honour you in this place tonight, Jesus. Miracle working, God. You're our healer, our provider. You're everything tonight. Yes. Your name is above every name. Jesus. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's go back to the verse. You are here, moving in and out. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here. Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, Lord. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. you are.
you, thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence in this place. We just love your presence. So I just want you to soak it in tonight, the anointing that's resident in the house. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. We welcome the angels. We thank you for the angelic realm. We thank you for the kingdom of God on earth. As it is in heaven, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the work you're doing in us tonight in your precious, precious, precious name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen and amen. So good. Thank you, team. You did a great job. Great musicians, right? Give them a clap. Amen. And we're looking forward to great days. I just, um, every day I get excited, more excited, as I'm hearing things and seeing things and reading his word. And it's just very exciting what God is doing in these days, I tell you. Um, I think we as a a corporate body are going to come into this together. And um, the fire of God is, is manifesting, is going to manifest even more. I want to start with a scripture on in Revelation chapter one, and uh, I want to I want to talk about John the Apostle John tonight. I'm going to bring to you my Bible study on John, and I just you know I want to share with you too that um, because God speaks to each one of us in different ways, and it's I like to just share how God is speaking t- through to me and. It's just the Apostle John, the man John. Um, Sometimes the Lord will put a seed thought in our minds and our hearts and our spirits. And what I encourage you or or, um, exhort you to do is to dig into the word with that seed thought. And even tonight there'll be seed thoughts. You know, write, write those things down and go back to the word because that's our foundation, that's what's um, solid here for us. And so tonight I'm just going to share with you a couple of verses actually from um, the book of Revelation when John is having a prophetic vision. And he's at the end of his, not the absolute end, he's not about to die, but he's in his late 80s, 90s. He's a senior. And they've just um, tried to kill him. They, they threw him in, history tells us that they threw him in, in boiling um, oil and uh, he never died. And they did it twice. This is what history tells us. They did this twice to get rid of him. Now, I want to I want to remind you that all the other apostles had been um, martyred in some way, including Paul. So they were all dead. <laughs> And John's the last one, uh, last man standing. And and I love this this his story because if we look at it, if we look at the story of the different um, persons or personalities in the Word of God, there's a there's a message, there's a revelation, there's a a teaching, there's a prophetic word that God wants to open us up to, so we could understand Him and His ways his character, his nature. Um, We understand him through the word. And so here in the book of Revelation, chapter one, I'm just gonna, there's so much in the whole chapter, but I wanna bring out two verses here. Verse nine, and he says, I, John, he's on the island of Patmos, by the way, he's in prison. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. So he's, he is and has been through tribulations right through his journey with, with the Lord because <laughs> they, they crucified the Lord and then they started trying to destroy the church, Paul being one of them, of course, throwing them in jail and, you know, so he's been through years 
of tribulation. And here he is in verse 9. I want to bring this out. He says, I, John, I'm your brother, my, my paraphrase, and your companion in the tribulation and the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ. When I was on the island of Patmos for the word of uh, for the word and for the testimony of Je- testimony of Jesus, all the way through the book of Revelation, you'll see how the Antichrist, how Satan, how the enemy, um, how the hordes of hell <laughs> hate the test hate the testimony of Jesus. And so he's he's in this place, and he. The enemy has not been allowed to touch him or kill him. There was another story I read actually this week where they tried to kill him. Oh, I think it was poison. They tried to give him poison and he didn't die. The enemy was not allowed to touch him. And here's, here's my point. You know, there's a time. <laughs> there's a time and a season. You know, I know, I know we can, um, the, the walls can be down. I know the, the gates can be, there can be breaches in the walls, if you like, where the enemy can get in. But there's a place of safety in God that the Lord wants all of us to come into, a place of protection, a place when the, where the wall of fire will surround his bride, his church. And, and you know, um, so with that said, coming back to this scripture in verse 9, he says, um, it's because of the testimony of Jesus that he's been thrown onto this island, abandoned island, he's there on his own. And then the Lord, he has an encounter with God. He, he, the heavens open is what he says. The heavens open and he has an encounter with God. Now, here is what I want to bring to us tonight. John was just a man like you and me, a, a human being is what I'm trying to say. He was a, it, all the way through the scriptures, we see ordinary human beings that God uses in absolutely amazing supernatural ways. We know the scripture, Elijah was just a man like you and I, and yet he prayed that it wouldn't rain, you know, and then he prayed that it would. So it's, it's God has given you and me, human beings, authority to shift things in the, in the, in the realm of the spirit. God is calling you and me to go into the heavenlies, this is why I believe part of, part of why John wrote this, because he wants us, he wanted us, he wants us to see and understand that he's our brother, <laughs> that, you know, he's, he's our companion, that he's been in, in, in tribulation. And it's in those times of tribulation that we can find God. It's in those times when we can have amazing encounters with him. So he says he was in the spirit. The Lord opened the heavens and he heard a loud voice. I'm going into verse 10, but actually I want to flip down to verse 14 because I don't want to hang around here too long. Verse 14, he's actually getting a picture of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the name of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, the whole of this book, John, God's giving John a revelation of who Jesus is. He knew Jesus on the earth. He knew the humanity of Jesus. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And who knows, he grew up with Jesus. He grew up in Galilee as Jesus did. So who knows the relationship he had before Jesus came into his calling, came, stepped into, his, into the miracles. But here, we, here he says, he's describing Jesus, verse 14. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Now, I want us to get a, a, a picture. I mean, when you get time, go through the whole um, image of Jesus. It's absolutely amazing. That the Lord wants us to see him in his, in his glory, He's in the he's in the he's he's at the right hand of the Father. He's in the heavenly places. He's 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 full of the glory of God. He's he he radiates, he beams with the glory of God. And as I was um, looking at verse 14, his head and hair were white like wool. Well, we know when he was on the earth, he, he probably had dark hair. <laughs> uh, we know that um, 
you know, he, he, we're not sure if he had fire in his, in his eyes at times, but here we, John is getting a picture, maybe similar to what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's getting a vision, a, 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 a picture of Jesus. Everything about him speaks. Everything about him is life. You know, it's power, um, it, it's love. Everything about Jesus speaks to you and I and, sp- and, and speaks to John. And so the whiteness to me speaks of glory, of light, of just, it says white, white as white as snow. The whiteness was, there was so much glory around the Son of God that um, John actually fell at his feet with, with fear. It, it says here, his eyes were like flames of fire. And I wanna, I want us to think about this for a wee while because I believe God is coming with fire in a fresh way. There's a fire that's coming to his church. There's a, a fire that he's calling you and I to carry out into the harvest the fire of God, and here we see the fire um, in his eyes. Like, you know, the fire of God is in in his eyes. And, you know, I can't, I don't don't get it fully, but what I do get here is that this flame of fire is, is, it it takes me to the book of um, Song of Solomon, (laughs) where it talks about um, the flame of fire being um, like a vehement fire. It's, it's a vehement burning fire. And when I went in to, to look at the different fires and the different stages of fire and colours of fire, we find that the blue fire is the most vehement fire. We find that when you, when you, when you see the blue, the blue's the hottest is what I'm trying to say. The, the blue is, um, I, I don't know, I forgot what the temperature is, but it's way hotter than, than the orange and the white. So the blue and here, I'm, I'm looking at the Son, I'm looking at the Son of God, I'm looking at Jesus, and I'm asking the question, what colour, <laughs> there's a reason, what colour w- w- were your eyes? You know, are, are we looking at, are we looking at flame, the blue flames? Are we looking at that vehement flame, that Song of Solomon, um, that we read there in Song of Solomon, lovers is... Um, um, uh, I'll come back to that scripture, but love is as strong as death. You know, you know, right through, before I move on to some other scriptures here, right through the book of Revelation, we, we get a picture of, of this passionate love that God has for his bride. It, it, it's, it's beautiful. You, you, can't, you can't read the book of Revelation and, the, and just get the, all the natural stuff and all the tribulation and all the, the you know, the, the, the difficulties that, you know, the plagues, the, you know, all the horrors. <laughs> We've got to look at the book of Revelation in the light of Jesus Christ, the shining Son of God, the Holy Spirit, the angels, the beauty you know, uh, chapter chapter twelve. I'll try uh, chapter four. I'll try not go too far into this, but the beauty of of God, the love of our Father, the love of Jesus. You know, we're talking love is as strong as death. <laughs> in Song of so- Solomon, when she w- when she was talking about, um, you know, the the fir- the the, uh, the the vehement flame of love, she was uh, Song of Solomon, and we see it again if we married it in with with the book of Revelation, we see the love of Jesus, the love of the Son for his bride, for his church, and he's coming back. Because he loves us, he's coming back. He's coming to destroy everything and anything (laughs) that stands in the way of his church, his bride. You know, it's a beautiful story and it's a beautiful picture to me because he, I believe there's a protection. You know, we, we, we see it in, in the Old Testament, when we read, um, when we read, you know, when he when he set the people from uh, free from Egypt, we see the miracle power of of God. We see His power there, protecting the people of Israel. I believe this day is coming in the end time again, when the church will be protected. But I do believe that we God is God is doing a work inside of us. 
you know, he's, he's, he's cleaning us out. It's like the fire burns the dross, causes the dross to come up. The fire deals with sin. You know, the fire deals with um, lethargy and, and um, the lukewarmness of, of the church. The fire brings conviction. The fire brings the fear of God. It brings change in our lives. And we need this church. We need God and we need His fire. Sunday morning, I think it was last Sunday, or one of the Sunday mornings, um, Murray was praying um, and he was asking us to pray for the fire of God to come on us. And the, the scripture that came to my mind was the, um, it was actually, you know, Isaac and, and um, you know, when he took his son, um, Abraham took Isaac to the altar and he laid his son Isaac on the altar. And this is what came to my mind. God, I lay myself on your altar. I lay myself, take me, burn me. You know, that story, of course, the Lord was the, is, was the sacrifice. The Lord is our sacrifice. But I wanna tell you, he wants to burn out all of the stuff, all of the compromise, the idols, the, uh, the, the things that are hindering us from being fully on fire for him or having that vermin flame in our eyes, having that passion for him and that passion for souls. All right, so I wanna move on to a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about John because this is what I've been studying this week is, is the, the Apostle John, you know, he, he had this encounter at the end of his journey and then he, you know, the Lord told him to write down the things that he was showing him. He came back, I guess he was writing the book of Revelation in that encounter, it, it looks like he was writing the book. But he came back and he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the three letters of John, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. This is significant because we're talking about a man that has gone through tribulation, seen his buddies, Peter, crucified upside down, jailed, tortured, tormented, killed, stoned. He's, he, he's seen... <laughs> He's gone through this tribulation uh, for years and years and he's, he's drawn into God and found God's protection through it all, found God's love through it all. And he comes back, this is what interests me, he comes back from this revelation that he has, book, book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, his love, the power, his life, and he begins to write the Gospel of John. Now think about it because Matthew, Mark, and Luke were already written years prior. The, the Gospel of John is different. It's a completely different book. <laughs> when you Christians ask me, what book should I read first? I say, read John, because it's the end of time story. It's the end of the story. It's the prophetic end of where the bride will be as she, as she functions here on the earth. And so we look at, you know, we look at, the Gospel of John, and of course he talks about the man Jesus, you know, the, the testimony of Jesus, the power of God. But you know what he talks about? Love. This is what has impacted him more than anything, and you see it in his writings. He talks about the love of God. He talks about abiding in him. He talks about how we, the church, how we, the children of God, can live and conquer sin. We see it in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. It's mostly red letter. It's what Jesus said. This man, John, not only lived with Jesus for three and a half years, but has been in fellowship with him. And we see that in the first letter of John when he talks about I think it's, um, he talks about love again and fellowshipping with him and how if we love one another, we will have fellowship with one another. We're talking spirit fellowship. We're not talking natural fellowship. We're not talking about, you know, the, th the things of this earth. We're talking, when you come and you connect and you re relate to people that are passionately in love with Jesus, and you're connecting and relating, you're feeding, you're, you're receiving from the revelation that they're living in, that they're sharing. See, there's something amazing about fellowship 
with the saints. Do not forsake the fellowship of the saints. We can come into a gathering like this and not be in fellowship. <laughs> we can come in and be isolated. Not, not realise it, but we, we, some of us even might feel odd, like something's wrong with me. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with you. The, the, the positive thing is you're here and, and, and God is pursuing you and me and God is doing a work inside of us and God's fire, passion is coming to deal with you and me. The, the deliverance, the healing, <laughs> the miracles is all part of God preparing his perfect bride. But when we look at John and we start to, I'm gonna go to, um, I'm gonna go to first, the first letter of John. You know, there's so much in the red letters of, about abiding in him, chapter 14 to 17. But here we have in the first letter of John, which is the longest letter out of the three, it says, um, you know, the, the commentaries, the history say, say that he wrote these three letters all at the same time, all together. One, two, three. He wrote them all together. And I want to sort of, I want us to look and I want us to look at why did he write these letters, and what is he wanting us, you and me, the church, to understand or receive from this? You know, let me just backtrack a wee bit because I want us to understand the man John. He, when he was called, and it's important we understand that to go through this. When he was called, they say he was anything from 13 to 16 years old. Hey, like, to me, that's encouraging. Most of the disciples were young. You know, there were a few teenagers amongst them, I understand. But he was, like, you don't... <laughs> he lived during the day when John the Baptist was, you know, in the desert, calling out, repent and be baptised. We don't find anything that says that he... He, he actually was baptised. He actually repented and baptised. But it's interesting, when Jesus came to call him to follow him, he dropped everything and followed him. And I, and I think he was going that next step. It's like, give you, give you all. <laughs> like, he was baptised, let's say. My, my, my suggestion is that because he knew, he knew John the Baptist and the thousands of people were going to hear him, and the, the, the gospel was, was being preached of repent, you know, repent from your sin and be baptized. So all of Israel was hearing this. He heard this. I believe he did. <laughs> and I believe from his attitude and his life and what we see in, the, in John's character that he probably, there's nothing written, but he probably went, repented and got baptized. And then he's out there on, his fishing, on the fishing boat with his brother working in, 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 in what we would call secular work, working a job, just working in his father's business. And Jesus comes along and says, follow me. He's 16, working for a da his dad, Zebedee. I d that, it doesn't really say much about his dad objecting to his son, two sons. John was the younger one of um, James and John. Two sons were working for the dad and they were fishing, right? The father doesn't say much, but then we read the father had hired helpers. That We read that the father had employees or people that were like, um, I don't know if I should use the word servant, but he had people that's, that worked in his business. And so when John and James got up and just left their job, their dad didn't oppose them. Their mum went with them. Now, isn't that interesting? I, I bring this to you because I want us to think about the, his, who he is, his character, his, his life, his response to Jesus, and why he called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He called himself, it says there in his um, writings, Six times, he says it six times, that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. We know the stories. We know that when he was at the Last Supper, he was right next to Jesus. 
And Jesus is talking about the betrayer. Someone was going to betray um, him. Peter's somewhere on the, at the table. And Peter says, Peter calls out or, or speaks, maybe not yelling out, but talks to John and says, ask him. Ask him who it is. And, you know, this speaks to me of the closeness that not just uh, physically close there by sitting right next to him, but he, it says he leaned on him. He leaned on his chest or um, bosom, it says in the New King James. He leaned right on him and he said, who is it? See, Jesus didn't announce to the 12. And here's my point. When we have intimacy with him, we hear the whispers. (laughs) We hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit. I wanna tell you, this life can be so noisy, (laughs) You know, the internet, the Facebook, the news, the people around us. Things can get so noisy. We hear all these other voices. But Jesus whispered to John. And John would have passed that information on to Peter. And here's another thought. I I haven't found anywhere where Jesus or his disciples criticized Judas. Jesus loved Judas. I'm bringing to you tonight the love of God that John the apostle encountered. I'm bringing that thought to you tonight. Jesus Jesus loved Judas. He washed his feet. He passed the, they were at the last supper. He didn't go talking to the other his closest uh, disciple, about Judas. This should speak to us about kingdom speaking. And so here they are at this table and Jesus whispers to them. But you know, what what I want to bring to you tonight is that John saw himself as the disciple Jesus loved. We see Peter um, said that too in one of the gospels, the disciple that Jesus loved. We see one of the other, Mary, I think it is, the disciple that Jesus loved. So John saw himself in that light. And this should speak to us because I don't believe Jesus has favorites. Although he favored, he favors his bride. See, I don't believe that he has individual favorites. He's looking for those that will draw close to him, that will lean on him, that will listen to the whispers. (laughs) Those that are seeking intimacy with him, putting him first and not listening to the group around you, the crowd around you. Those are the ones he loves. We know in context from the scriptures, for God so loved the world. God loved Mary, it says. John himself talks about this in his gospel. God, uh, uh, Jesus loved Martha (laughs) and her sister and Lazarus. And there's many, many times when Jesus witnessed the love of God Uh, Sorry, when John witnessed the love of God through Jesus, Jesus wept. There were many times when Jesus, he was moved and healed the sick. There were many times he fed the hungry. So we've got this man, John, who had the revelation of the love of the Father. Jesus said, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, John has this revelation. And when he says, uh, when when he says about himself that I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, I want you to think about this because he's not promoting himself. He knows Jesus loves all. (laughs) Jesus loves all men. He died for all men. John 
3.16, he quoted that himself, he wrote that himself. He loves all men. But he said, I am the disciple that Jesus loves. There's a message in that for you and I. He's not saying, I'm the man. <laughs> I'm John. <laughs> he's, he's humbling himself in a sense by speaking out, by saying he's one of the disciples. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Why did Jesus love him? Because of the intimacy, because of the closeness, because of the nearness. And I want to say with this is that God is calling you and me into intimacy, into the holy of holies, into the throne room, into that place where it's just him and me, into that place where only God speaks and I don't. <laughs> into that place of total yieldedness. God is calling us into that place, church, His bride, His beautiful bride. I've been listening to um, John Pawson. Murray suggested that we, we listen to John Pawson. I, 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 I found him so fascinating, to put it, put a, find a word, in the way that he views the Scriptures. I want to encourage you because I've read a lot of books and a lot of commentaries and I love to study the Word and I've studied with different people. But when I, when I, started, when I listened to John Pawson about the disciple John, since I've been studying that with other um, commentaries and in the Word myself, when I listened to him, he, he just shed another, a whole new light on this man, John. And he brings out, I'll bring it to you here from, um, he brings out the, the, in the three letters. He says that John, in the first, first letter of John, the epistle of John, he said, he's writing this letter. I always ask the question, John, why are you writing this letter? It's a Bible study, right? I'm just giving you my Bible study. Why are you writing this letter? Why did you write this letter, John? And who are you writing it to? And what did you want us to receive? And then I hear John Pawson say, he's writing to three generations. I never saw that before. Little children, fathers, young men. He's writing to three generations. I found this really encouraging because I thought, never too young, never too old. <laughs> He has something specific to say to each individual age group, if you like. You know, um, for me, it's incredible because God always speaks to generations. It's not about you and me. It's about those that went before me and those that will come after me. It's, it's never about you and me <laughs> in the sense that Everything he's done inside of me or any encounter that I have is actually for my sons and daughters. We can go all the way back to Abraham, but let's go back to John. The encounters that he had with, with, with God is for you and me. This is why it's written. This is why he's, he's, he's bringing this to the, the three generations the things that he brings out in the first um, epistle of John, he, he brings out really strong that God is light. Remember, he's been into the realm of the Spirit. Remember book of Revelation? The light, the glory on his, on his face. <laughs> that God is light. That God is love. There's three points he brings out in the first letter. That, that, and if you, go, if you read through the book, you'll see it, especially in the, in the chapter four of uh, revelation, the love of God, the amazing, unconditional, incredible, um, we just don't have language to, to fully express why God loves you and me when we know we've all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God and we all make mistakes and we all, you know, at various times in our life have had a bad run, right, I'll put it like that. But God is love and God is life. So out of him oozes. He is life. We think we've got life because we can breathe at the moment. The breath of God is, is God's. <laughs> He's the life. 
I mean, it's just, to, for me, if we could just soak it all in, and then he just talks to the, um, the fathers and the sons and the grandsons about uh, who, who he is, abide in him. <laughs> Don't be deceived. You know, um, if anybody sins, we have an advocate with the Father. But you know, we've got, the first chapter's really, and second chapter is, is, is our theology, really. It's like, if we, you know, I'll have to read it verse by verse, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, but he basically says, do not sin. If you're born again, if you're living for God, you cannot sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, it's verse eight. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all um, unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we must we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. You know, if, if we, we've got to take everything in context, but here he's telling us that we should not sin. What he's, what he's doing in the first chapter there, he's giving us the keys to walk holy, <laughs> to, to, to conquer. You know, there's no condemnation here because if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. But he's writing this first, second, you know, chapter, he's giving us keys so we don't have to live in sin. This is why we... Uh, are talking about this grace, cheap grace doctrine that's out there in the church. It's a lookalike church where it's okay to be a homosexual. <laughs> it's okay to be an adultery, fornication, and so on and so on, to steal, to do whatever, live the life you, can, you wanna live, and you're still gonna get to heaven. I wanna tell you, John says it's not okay. <laughs> It's not okay. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone has, a, 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 anyone sins, he's an advocate with the Father. So, you know, the blood of Jesus is, our, is, is why we should constantly worship him, thank him for our salvation. Verse six and all the way through, it just talks about abiding in him. How, how can we live a life where we're not sinning? by abiding in him. John 16, 17, 18. Abiding in him, living, hearing the whispers, <laughs> intimacy with him. And this is how we, we can walk with him. And this is how we can conquer. And this is how we can live with the authority of, of God on our lives, with the kingdom of God on our lives. And so, let me check the time. <laughs> And so the, the disciple who um, Jesus loved is how he labelled himself or how he um, spoke about himself when he came back from his encounter in the book of Revelation. He's the disciple that Jesus loved. And once again, it's he has died to himself. You know, He's had a revelation not only that Jesus loves him, but he loves Jesus. <laughs> I mean, he got that in the early days because we can see that he went through such tribulation. And when he gets to, you know, he got that, but he's writing it for you and me. Like, get it. We need, <laughs> we need to get it. Like the love of God to, to actually have a revelation, you know, and that, that continues to grow because there's no... We grow in that revelation. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We have the love of God. And as the fire comes, the love gets unblocked, the, the, the dross gets, you know. So I wanna finish with this. Well, I wanna talk about that fire a bit because I came across some scriptures that talks about the, um, the, the, the depth of God's love. You know, it says in First Corinthians, it says, um, the, spirit, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. 
And I want you to just visualize the deep things of God. The deep things of God is not, so, I'm not seeing that as great revelation. I'm seeing the deep love, the, the love of God. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit can help us. He searches all things, help us deal with the stuff that, that hinders the love of God from flowing through our lives. God wants to impart into us his passionate love. And I've read that scripture out to you from Song of Solomon. I'll read it again because I think it's worth, I want to sort of nail it down if I, if I can. The Song of Solomon, eight, it's in 8 verse 6. Love is as strong as death. These, the disciples died, were prepared to die, were prepared to, you know, remember Je um, uh, Peter, Peter was crucified upside down. He asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy enough to be crucified the right way up. He so loved the Lord. Do you know there's a, there's a, there's a vehement love, there's a passionate love that I believe God will, is coming to us or will bring, is bringing to us as we begin to get a glimpse of his love. There's, a, there's an exchange almost, the, the glory to glory. You know, the glory of God comes into our lives, his love, as we, 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 we see him more clearly. But love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. The coals there are of a coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. And so if you just picture this description that Solomon is seeing in the bride of Christ, <laughs> this is the bride of Christ. You get the picture. She's got this love. How did she get this love? She, she, she recognized that she was the disciple that God loved. She recognized that because of his love, <laughs> her life was given over. Her life was radically changed. Because of the love that he revealed to her, she was able to embrace that. John said, we loved him because he first loved us. And that's my point. <laughs> John saw his love first before he loved him. It's, look, this is something we, we go for, we run toward. This is something I believe God wants us to encounter. His love, his throne room, his, his beauty, his awesome goodness. And then I wanna just bring out this other third point about the blue flame. Because blue, I've heard this over the years, I've listened to many prophetic people, and I've heard that the color blue is the, uh, means revelation. It's always like, I want revelation. And what that is, is I just want to know you more, Father. I wanna see you more. I want revelation. One day the Lord said to me, when you're walking in the revelation I've given you, Another time the Lord said to me, revelation will expand you. It came out of a prayer, God, I just, I feel so weak. I just, I don't wanna see anybody. I, don't, I just wanna hide in my cave. And the Lord says, revelation will expand you. We need revelation for the harvest. <laughs> we need the revelation for one another, to love one another. This is the commandment that John was giving in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, the letters. Love one another. Love one another. And so here, you know, uh, as I thought about the, the color blue, I thought, about the, I thought about the blue flame first, and then the color blue <laughs> being a, uh, the, meaning revelation, the prophetic people have said that, and I thought, I wonder where they get that from. Like, where's that, you know, in the word? And I found something in Exodus 20, 24, it says, um, 24, 10, and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stoned, stone. In other words, blue, sapphire, the gem, the whole of the, the heavenly plate, you know, the the, 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 the temple of God is just full of pearls and gold and, you know, all sorts of gems. But under his feet, 
it says here was sapphire, was the blue sapphire. I mean, the, it, it's the, the body of heaven, let me say it like this, is, is I believe there's a, there's, a, there's a cleanness, there's a clear, clearness. I remember one time before I became a Christian, I looked into the sky one time, blue sky, and I said in my heart, is there a God out there? Is there something more than what this life offers me? And I, I wanna bring back to you the blue. <laughs> the skies is, a, is symbolic of the, of, the blue, of the blue in heaven. It's the symbolic of the open heavens. Let me put it like that. And I know I'm just bringing you just some th thoughts. I mean, really for me, it's just, it's all about, it's all about him. It's all about the fire of God. It's all about um, hearing the whispers of God. And it's all about understanding where we're, where we're at now as a church and where God wants to take us. You know, Jesus, when, when John and James walked with Jesus, it was interesting, I'm gonna finish in a little bit, but I wanna say this about his mother, um, John's mother, it says there that she traveled and ministered to Jesus. It says that there was a, 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 a number of women that traveled with Jesus and they followed him into Jerusalem and Salome, who was John's mother, and some commentaries, in fact, John even indicates that Salome was the sister of Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you could do your own study on that. And I've gone back to it and picked out the scriptures and I see that John is suggesting that his mother is the sister of Jesus. This is interesting because when Jesus was crucified, it says that the mother of Jesus was there and Salome was there. It says, in fact, John says, um, Mary's sister was there. And in other scriptures, it says Salome was there. So I'm sort of leaning toward convinced that, that and I'm not saying it as a, as a, a doctrine or anything, but convinced that, that, that Salome, J J John's mother, was the sister of Jesus. And it makes sense She's standing at the cross, mother's there. Remember, father is a businessman. <laughs> He's got a little bit of wealth that his wife can travel. And it says that they were generous in their giving toward Jesus. So he's got a little bit of wealth right there. It makes sense to me that Jesus, one of the last things he said to John, John, my mother, take care of her. He takes his mother back to his home. That's what it says. Who's living in the home? His mother's sister. I just think these things I find intriguing because if you study Salome and her life a wee bit, Zebedee and his life, that it took, this t t t for us shows us the love of God, the character of God, the beauty of God, the way God takes care, care of us, he doesn't isolate. Jesus didn't expect John to go and build a little house for his mother. No, he knew that, that John could take her home. He knew there was a place for her, an extra room. Who knows the size of the house they lived in? He looked after his mother till the day she passed. So, you know, there's so many little things that I could, I could talk about, but I wanna finish off with, uh, I wanna just finish off with, you know, it's in the transformation of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's as God transforms our minds, we are transformed into the image of Christ. You know, as, as he transforms our minds, I think I am so daily almost asking the Lord, transform my mind because it's in the transform of our, transformation of our minds that we can go into these places. And I think there are many places that God wants to take us in the realm of the spirit. We can go into these places with transformed minds. So I, I, I'm finishing right there that in the transformed mind, love is as strong as death. 
Jealousy as cruel as the grave. The fire is a vehement fire. And this is a description of his bride, his beautiful bride. Amen? Amen. So let's just um, finish t- t- tonight with a song. That second song, um, that first song you sung, um, Isha, is it a revival song? Let's finish with that song. Everybody stand. Amen.
this church.